Warning, this episode contains brain food that will lead to improved emotional and social intelligence. Give us one hour and we'll help you change the way you think about happiness. Harvesting Happiness with Lisa Cypress Kamen is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven media that promotes well-being from the inside out. Each week, Lisa spotlights diverse trendsetters and change agents who are the greatest contemporary thinkers and doers, devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. Your host, Lisa Cypress Kamen, is a widely recognized applied positive psychology expert, author, documentary filmmaker, and lecturer specializing in optimal lifestyle management. Let's get to it. Here's Lisa. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Thanks for joining us on today's show, where you will learn about tasting truth, feeding ourselves healthy, and hacking our hardwired brains. My first guest is Dr. Robert Lustig. His latest book is Metabolical, The Lore and the Lies of Processed Food, Nutrition, and Modern Medicine. Before I introduce Dr. Lustig, I want to just talk about the collective experience with feeding ourselves that we've all just been through. You know, there is the the, the statement of the COVID-20 that all of us have packed it on by staying at home and cooking good food, learning how to bake, et cetera, et cetera. But truth be told, there's another perspective to this. And that's what Dr. Lustig is going to share with us today. Dr. Lustig is Emeritus Professor of Pediatrics in the Division of Endocrinology and member of the Institute for Health Policy Studies at the University of California, San Francisco. His 2009 YouTube lecture, Sugar, the Bitter Truth, has accrued 12 million views. He is also the chief science officer for the nonprofit Eat Real, dedicated to reversing childhood obesity and type 2 diabetes by bringing real foods into schools. He has never taken money from the food industry, so he has no conflicts of interest, but has our good interest at heart. Welcome back to the show, Dr. Lustig. Thanks for having me, Lisa. My pleasure. Oh, well, it, this is a this is a big topic right now because we are what we eat. You know, talk a little bit about the foods that we are ingesting as a North American society, how adulterated those foods are and how it's impacting our health and well-being. Well, I would argue that you've gotten it wrong, Lisa. We are not what we eat. That's how we got into this mess, because we are what we eat suggests that what's in the food is what's in us. And that is absolutely missing the point. In fact, in the book Fat Chance, I argued that we are not what we eat, we are what we do with what we eat, that actually metabolism matters the most, and how different foods alter that metabolism matter. Uh, and that, of course, is where sugar comes in, because it does the most damage. In this book, Metabolical, even I admit I got it wrong, because it is not what we do with what we eat, it is what, it is what they did with what we eat that matters. And so what I'm doing is I'm calling attention to the practices of the ultra processed food industry to actually uh, make poison. Uh, and in the book, I very specifically state what it is about food that provides health or provides illness. Because we often say good food is medicine, bad food needs medicine. And the question is, well, what about bad food actually makes you need medicine. And the answer Ooh. is, the answer is good food has a definition and bad food also has a definition. And that's what I do in the book is I lay that out. What is healthy? How do you define healthy? You know, different food companies define it different ways. The U.S. government defines it a different way and all of them are wrong. Well, like, for example, healthy is not necessarily gluten free. That's right. <laughs> healthy is not necessarily gluten free. It might be depending on the patient. Right. You know, depends on what's wrong with you. Like, for instance, I'm not gluten free. I'm wheat free. And the question is, can I have barley and rye and be OK? And the answer is yes. And the reason is because my problem is not gluten. My problem is wheat. So we can talk about that if you want and how we know that. 
But the bottom line is, what is healthy? And I have an entire chapter devoted to this whole question and how it's been bastardized over the years. Here's my definition of healthy. Six words, two clauses, and it makes sense with the empiric data. Number one, protect the liver. Number two, feed the gut. Any food that does both is healthy. Any food that does neither is poison. And any food that does one or the other, but not both, is somewhere in the middle. So now, give us some examples of, of foods that protect the liver and feed the gut. And I love this, by the way, because it makes it simple. It makes it simple. So any food that came out of the ground or any animal that ate the food that came out of the ground is healthy. All food is inherently good. It's what we do to the food that's not. Let me give you an example. An apple. An apple is healthy. Now you say, wait a second, apple has sugar in it. Well, yes, it's got very little sugar. It's only got about um, 15 to 30 calories, depending on the size of the apple. But it has way more fiber. And it has two kinds of fiber, not one. It has soluble and insoluble. Soluble fiber is like pectins or inulin, like what holds jelly together. Insoluble fiber is cellulose, like the stringy stuff in the celery. Apples have both. You need both. The sugar in the apple, if it were isolated from the apple separately, would be toxic. It would flood the liver. It would basically turn into liver fat, not protecting the liver. But because of the presence of both the soluble and insoluble fiber in the apple, turns out those two fibers together form a gel on the inside of the duodenum, an impenetrable barrier that prevents absorption of mono and disaccharides like sugar from getting to the liver in the first place, thus protecting the liver, reducing the glycemic excursion, and therefore reducing the insulin response. In addition, the, because the food doesn't get absorbed early, it goes further down the intestine where the microbiome is, where the bacteria are. And so the microbiome will chew up that sugar that you would have potentially absorbed but it'll do it for its own purposes. That is, i.e., you're feeding the gut. In addition, the soluble fiber, you know, the pectins and the, ins and the inulin, will go to the colon, and the colon has bacteria there that will change that um, soluble fiber into short-chain fatty acids, butyrate and propionate, which are both immune-suppressive and insulin-suppressive, both contributing to improved metabolic health. So. An apple is healthy because it protects the liver and it feeds the gut. Wait, let me now ask you a question about that. Is it an sure. organic apple versus traditionally farmed apple? Does it matter? So, so for an apple, it doesn't. And the reason is because an apple has a hard skin. So when the uh, pesticides are sprayed on the apple, they're there, but you can wash them off. Now, if it's a berry then it has a soft skin, the pesticides can get in. And so then organic may make more, of a, uh, make more sense. And there's this phenomenon, you know, called the dirty dozen about, you know, or, uh, organic versus pesticide laden uh, produce. And the way to, uh, you know, determine it is if it's got a skin that you eat, then, um, and it's washable, it's okay. If it's got a skin you peel off like a banana, that's okay too. But if you're going to, if the so skin is soft and you're going to eat it, then you probably want to be more careful about uh, buying organic. And that's sort of the way. Now let's turn for a moment to a different form of apple. Let's talk about apple juice. So in apple juice, the fiber has been removed. It's been excluded. It's been sheared away to, to, by, uh, to smithereens. Even if you do it in a smoothie, you have sheared the insoluble fiber into component pieces that are too small for it to act as that gel. And so what happens is you end up flooding the liver instead of protecting it. Now, it's true, the soluble fiber is still there, so you are feeding the gut. So apple juice is not as bad as, say, an apple drink, but in fact, it's not as good as the original apple. So, but let me just clarify something. One thing here, because I love juices. Like I love to go get like a, a, like Liver Nation is my favorite juice smoothie. It's got, you know, 
beet juice, et cetera, et cetera. What you're saying is that that's not as healthy as just eating the whole fruit or vegetable. That's exactly right. Okay. Now, lots of people smoothie their vegetables. So a green smoothie doesn't have anything to protect the liver from. So the fact that you're not uh, protecting the liver is not nearly as bad. You're still feeding the gut, so that's good. Uh, on the other hand, if it's a fruit smoothie, what you've done is you've liberated those molecules of uh, sugar to be able to be absorbed rapidly. And so you are not protecting the liver. And so you can look at the glycemic excursion after a smoothie, and it is ba basically the same as if you were drinking a, 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 you know, a fruit drink. So, um, no, that the, the, the whole fruit smoothie movement needs to be rethought. Mm. If it's green smoothie, you know, have at it. You know, I think the vegetables are still better. Um, the question is, what's applesauce? Is applesauce more like apples or is applesauce more like apple juice? I would say that it's uh, probably more like apple juice because it's, it's just it's broken down. But I, I, I might be wrong. That's exactly right. So applesauce is more like apple juice. So even though it came from apples, it's clearly not as good as the original. So what I'm saying is it's not what's in the food. It's what's been done to the food that matters. That we do to the food. not that even do, or, or that they did, you know, that the industry did to the food that matters. And you have to understand the difference. And if you understand the difference, then you can figure out, whether or not you are protecting the liver, and whether or not you are feeding the gut. And when you can do that, then you'll know what's healthy. So when we talk about protecting the liver and feeding the gut, and we talk about chronic illnesses, and what Western modern medicine does, which is you know treating the, uh, the symptoms of the illness, but not the root cause of the illness, how do, right. you, how do you teach patients, how do we teach society to feed ourselves more properly. So the first thing you have to understand is that what people are th currently thinking are the diseases are not the diseases. So people think type 2 diabetes, hypertension, lipid problems, cardiovascular disease, cancer, dementia, fatty liver disease, polycystic ovarian disease. These are all chronic metabolic diseases. These all have ICD-11 codes. These are all things doctors can bill for. Mm. Now, they have medicines. Every one of those has a medicine. But the medicine doesn't treat the disease. The medicine treats the symptoms. The high blood glucose is not the disease. The high blood glucose is the symptom of the disease. The high blood pressure is not the disease. It is the symptom of the disease. The high LDL is not the disease. It is the symptom of the disease. Treating the symptom of the disease does not fix the disease. It's like giving an aspirin to a patient with a brain tumor because they have a headache. Right. It might help their headache, but it ain't going to help their brain tumor. Right. And still die. But there's a disconnect in the way that we feed ourselves, clearly. Exactly. exactly. And the reason is because we think that there's a pill for this. So every one of those diseases that I just mentioned are really just symptoms of eight underlying subcellular pathologies that we can't get to with medicines. And I'm going to name them real quick for time. Number one, glycation. Number two, oxidative stress. Number three, mitochondrial dysfunction. Number four, insulin resistance. Number five, membrane instability. Number six, inflammation. Number seven, methylation. And number eight, autophagy. Now, wow, that's none, a lot. <laughs> none of those have an ICD-9 code. None of those are things that doctors talk to their patients about. None of those have a drug. Every one of them is fixable with food. These are foodable, not druggable. And they are at the basis of all of the chronic metabolic diseases that have overtaken our entire healthcare system. And the reason we have not got, gotten better is because we are just basically putting a Band-Aid on the problem. We are not actually fixing the problem. Well, it's, it's screaming for education. We are going to need to take a break. And when we come back, we will continue the conversation with Dr. Robert Lustig. We're talking about his newest book, Metabolical, The Lore and the Lies of Processed Food, Nutrition, and Modern Medicine. To learn more about Dr. Lustig's work, his books, please visit robertlustig.com, on Twitter at robertlustigmd, and on Facebook, 
Dr. Robert Lustig. And one more on Instagram, Robert Lustig, MD. Here comes the pause. We'll be right back. And that is a guarantee. To learn more about cultivating sustainable well-being at home and the office, visit HarvestingHappiness.com and explore Lisa's experiential on-site brain fitness workshops, corporate programming, and speaking engagement services. Welcome back. If you're just joining us now, we're talking about tasting truth, feeding ourselves healthy and hacking our hardwired brains. Let's get back to the discussion with Dr. Robert Lustig. So in the last segment, we were talking about protecting the liver and feeding the gut as a way to regain health and vitality, Dr. Lustig. Let's talk a little bit about how we can diagnose our own biochemical profile. Absolutely. So the problem is you go to the doctor and the doctor says, oh, all your lab tests are normal. And you accept that. And I, my, my argument is never accept normal for an answer, ever. The information is in the numbers. Don't take normal. Because what basically what your doctor is telling you is, I don't know how to interpret any of these. And I'm just reading off the side of the lab slip. Because there's an H and an L, high, low, next to each of the uh, reference ranges. And none of those really matter. What you need to understand is what's actually going on inside your body. And the question is, how can you, as a consumer, figure that out? Well, you need the numbers in order to do it. Let me give you an example. My favorite, ALT, alanine aminotransferase. This is a standard liver function test. It's done on a standard chem panel. Pretty much anyone who ever has gotten their blood drawn at the doctor's office has this number. Now, the reference range for ALT says that normal is up to 40, except for one thing. When I entered medical school in 1976, the normal range was up to 25. Wow. The same test. Wow. <laughs> okay, but 50 years later, we went from 25 being normal to 40 being normal. Why is that? I don't, it turns out it's because everyone has fatty liver disease. Mm. And when you have fatty liver disease, your ALT goes up. And since they, people with fatty liver disease don't know they're sick until they're very late in the, in the, in the stages of uh, fatty liver disease, um, they get included with all the other, uh, quote, normal people, and the entire curve has shifted to the right. And so when the clinical lab determines what the normal range for their lab is, they take thousands of quote, healthy, unquote, people, and they do the Gaussian distribution, and they draw two standard deviations from the mean, and that's your high and your low, and now that's at 40. That doesn't make it normal. It just makes it what it is for, to, for the people who walked in uh, this past year. Well, the fact of the matter is it, uh, the upper limit of normal is real, still 25, but your doctor doesn't know that because your doctor doesn't know how to read those because they never learned how. And maybe they entered medical school after the ALT already went up. Uh, I didn't. So the bottom line is understanding that will change, you know, how you look at your lab tests. Uh, and this is just one example. Another example would be uric acid. So uric acid is a, um, uh, an indirect proxy measure for meat consumption, but it's also an indirect proxy measure for sugar consumption. And a normal uric acid should be below 5.5. But again, if you look at the upper range, uh, it will, it, it, the cutoff is 7. Now, if you've got a uric acid of 7, you've got a problem. And you don't know it because, after all, it, you know, the lab slip didn't flag it. And your doctor says, well, it's all normal. That's not true. Same thing is true for LDL. Turns out LDL is not really the bad guy in this heart disease story. The real bad guy is triglycerides. The, re the relative risk ratio for a heart attack due to a high LDL is 1.3. In other words, 30% greater. The relative risk ratio for a heart attack due to a high triglyceride is 1.8. 80% greater. So you have to understand that that LDL, you don't look at it as a number. You have to look at it as a pattern. 
And the way to look at it is in, in relation to the triglyceride level. And the book in chapter nine explains how you interpret lab tests. So you can actually figure out what your own personal metabolic health is. And then you can tell your doctor what it is. So let me just ask you something about the triglycerides. An elevated triglyceride would come from a high, high fat diet, wouldn't it? Fried no. foods? No. No, 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 absolutely not. Well, not. so that's, tell, do tell. That's, that's, the, that's the fallacy. So triglyceride is VLDL, very low density lipoproteins. In the fasting state, unless you have type 5 hyperproteinemia, which is 1 in 10,000, Okay. In the fasting state, your tri serum triglyceride is your VLDL, very low density lipoproteins. These are the lipoproteins that come from your liver. And it turns out that they are related to your sugar consumption, not your fat consumption. Oh. Your dietary fat consumption is in your LDL. That is true. And, when, and dietary fat raises your LDL. That is true. I don't argue that. But there are two LDLs, not one. Now, the lab test measures both. It measures the large buoyant LDL, which it turns out is cardiovascularly neutral and is about 80% of your LDL. And it also measures the small dense LDL, which is the atherogenic particle, which is only about 20% of your LDL. So the atherogenic particle is only about one fifth of the total. So it dil so the, the, the stuff that is cardiovascularly neutral dilutes the number. So you don't really know whether or not you got a problem unless you look at the triglyceride because the triglyceride is actually the fat coming from the liver and is completely responsive to your carbohydrate and primarily your added sugar consumption. And so that is the primary driver of heart disease. And what we really should wow. be looking at is our post prandial triglyceride rise, but people don't do that yet. But we're actually working with companies to be able to do that in real time with wearables. Uh, we're not there yet, though. The point is that your doctor, if he doesn't know how to interpret your lipid profile, he's going to tell you, well, your LDL is high, therefore you should be on a statin. No. Of course. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's not what it means. Okay, what it means is you need to look at your triglyceride. And if your triglyceride is also high, so if your LDL and your triglyceride are both high, now that, that means you have metabolic syndrome. And you need to fix your diet to improve your insulin resistance. You might need metformin, possibly, if your if diet alone won't fix it. But a statin is probably not the first thing you should uh, reach for. Well, that's certainly good to know. I want to ask you about these different types of diets. There's right now there's this war between vegan and keto diets, for example. Talk a little bit about what each one does or is supposed to do and how successful they really are at accomplishing that goal. So I don't have a horse in this race. All right. I am not pro or anti keto. I am not pro or anti vegan. People can be what they want to be. Okay, I am not against any of them. You have to recognize what their limitations are. You have to recognize what you have to supplement if you are on either of them. And neither of them are complete in and of themselves. There are things you are, are uh, ignoring if you are just basically eating straight vegan or straight keto. But there are ways to make it work for you, and, I'm, and I explain in the book what they are. But the fact of the matter is that keto and vegan actually have more in common than they have in difference. Everything on a keto diet is real food. Everything on a straight vegan diet is real food. Now, unfortunately, Coke, Doritos, and Oreos are all <laughs> vegan. <laughs> So you can do a vegan diet badly. Yeah. And if you do, that's like the worst. That is absolutely the worst because what you've done is you have done a low fat, high sugar diet, which is absolutely documented. The single worst diet on the planet is a low fat, high sugar diet. And that's what doing vegan wrong is. Now, can you do keto wrong? Absolutely. So if you want to be on a ketogenic diet, you have to be absolutely fastidious because any insulin 
that your pancreas makes is going to suppress ketogenesis and it's going to take you out of ketosis. And the problem is we have keto ice creams in the uh, store. Okay, and they all say five, you know, six grams of sugar or, you know, added sugar per serving. Well, it's way lower than, you know, the, the standard ice cream, but that doesn't make it keto. It just makes it lower in sugar. And the fact is, if you turn off that, um, if you turn off that ketogenesis by raising your insulin, because your um, uh, uh, ability to liberate ketones at the level of the liver is completely dependent on your insulin level. Uh, basically, what you're on is a moderate. Uh, uh, what you're on is a high fat, moderate sugar diet, and that is also bad for you. So, if you don't actually pay attention to what you're doing, you can actually get in trouble with either diet. The fact is, they have more in common than they have in different because they're all real food. Mm, interesting. It's ultra processed food that's on the other side. The keto vegans should be joining forces, not fighting with each other. We're almost out of time. And I want to just get into sort of the politics of food for a moment, because what I hear you talking about between big food, big pharma and big government is that there is a great investment in keeping us fat, sick and compliant. Indeed. And uh, all you have to do is look at what pharma has done to its portfolio over the last 30 years. They have shifted from acute care drugs to chronic care drugs because you're going to be on those for the next 20, 30, 40 yeah. years. And since Big Pharma controls the medical school curriculum, you think that they're going to tell doctors how to actually take care of problems with food? That would cut into their profits, wouldn't it? Yeah, but it's so much better for the consumer. I mean, you know, to, to know that we have the power to heal ourselves through the food choices that we make and the lifestyle interventions that we engage in, I, I find very empowering. And that's why I love covering it on the show. Well, it is empowering, but, the, but first you have to recognize that the secret to health care is fixing health. And the secret to health is fixing diet. And the secret to fixing diet is understanding what the hell is wrong. Yeah. And we've been getting it wrong for the last 50 years. Wow. Uh, this is food for thought and consumption. You know, the book we're talking about is Metabolical, The Lore and the Lies of Processed Food, Nutrition and Modern Medicine. My guest today has been Dr. Robert H. Lustig. He's been on the show before where we spoke about his first book, uh, which was a New York Times bestseller, Fat Chance. To learn more about Dr. Lustig's work, please go to robertlustig.com, on Twitter at Robert Lustig MD, on Facebook, Dr. Robert Lustig, and on Instagram, that handle is Robert Lustig MD. Thanks so much for coming on the show and sharing your knowledge with us and really uh, inspiring some changes that we all know we need to make. Well, thanks so much for having me, Lisa. A it's pleasure. been a pleasure. Here comes the pause. We'll be right back. Did you know that happiness is actually good for your health? Happy people live longer, are more productive, and make better partners, parents, and professionals. Connect with us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and follow Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen for a daily dose of inspiration. back continuing the conversation about tasting truth feeding ourselves healthy and hacking our hardwired brains my next guest is dr robert barrett he has spent much of his life studying behavior group dynamics and organizational culture and he is the recipient of 15 major academic awards for his contributions to the way we perceive and remedy deep conflict he's written a book entitled hardwired how our instincts to be healthy are making us sick. In other words, we're overstimulated and undercared for. And what can we do about it? Welcome, Dr. Barrett. Great. Thanks. Glad to be here. Glad to have you. Let's talk about what's going on right now in the climate that we are living in, whether we are in the United States or living abroad. We kind of are living through a war of sorts. 
Yeah, we are. It's unfortunate, but you know, I think we're all feeling it on a few different fronts. Uh, one is, of course, uh, the obvious political uh, front that's ha- particularly happening in the states right now. But you know, perhaps in some parts of the world, uh, also mirroring what is happening in the states. But that's the big story. Uh, a lot of conflict there on both sides. Uh, a lot of emotions. And a lot of uh, trenching into very uh, hard political views on both sides. And I think we're feeling that. We're feeling that that stress. Um, We talk a lot about uh, in the book as well, just outside of politics, too, just about the, the fact that we are seeing so much change in the world around us with respect to social media, the way that we communicate um, the way that we use our you know, smartphones every day, all day long, and how that affects our brains, how it affects our sleep uh, and the stress, and then some of that actually manifesting in our own physiology with respect to uh, the stress and the, the, the obesity levels, growing diabetes, um, lack of sleep, and how that affects us as well with respect to cancer rates. All of these things seem to be coming together in one big uh sort of biological storm, as it were, um, in the last, really last 10 or 20 years. So that's kind of what we're dealing with. And it's a, it's a troublesome trend. And we're seeing some really, some really astounding negative uh, implications. Um, just pulling one out, one of, the, one of the things we talk about in the book, which is really fascinating when we dug into it, was if you look at the longevity um, for the last thousand years, uh, Typically, aside from wars and plagues and, and whatnot, the the longevity that we experience goes up a little bit every year. So that's a positive trend. You know, one generation is is older than the generation before it. But it, that's all that's except for the last 10 years or so. And the, we started seeing in the about the mid, well, I guess about the mid 1990s, we saw a dip in longevity. And really, that's about the first time in a thousand years. So, you know, what the heck is happening there? And uh, how does that what does that mean for some really big trends with respect to health? And what do you attribute the the dip to? Is it the advent of social media? Is it the advent of these uh, smartphones that we can't seem to uh, disengage from our person? What What is it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, you know, so they they saw the dip actually in a lot of industrialized countries. So it wasn't not just talking about the U.S., but what is interesting is most of those countries recovered from the dip, so to speak. But the U.S. has been very slow to recover. We're just beginning to see some signs that the U.S. is climbing out of this this so-called dip. But um, it it does present a unique case. We make the, we we point out that that this dip did occur about the time that that the internet um, became fairly common in households as well. But uh, the dip, if you look at some of the um, epidemiology behind it, uh, they're pointing to what we call midlife uh, mortalities, an increase in midlife mortality. So. So some of the things that we would might attribute to behavior, so those are, say, prescription medications, yeah. smoking, alcohol use, um, lifestyle things that, that we might have control over um, with, you know, with outside of the genetics. Those are the kinds of things that are now contributing to a, a dip that we're seeing. And that is happening more so in midlife rather than later in life. Do you think that's because the pleasure center of the brain is being overstimulated. Like when you look at what happens neurologically to the brain, when we are playing with our smartphones and how it taps into the brain's want for dopamine, that um, we're trying to get it in any way that we can. And therefore we're sparking out. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, that, that goes back to the, even the title of the book, Hardwired. So, you know, we we come built, evolved, finally, finely tuned um, to survive. And part of that is, as you say, the reward center of the brain, which is essential for survival. Yes. That's what motivates us to go out and get food. It motivates us to go out and find a mate, you know, um, somewhere that's not in our, you know, immediate social circle. Um, these are the kinds of things that, that, you know, that dopamine helps us do. Uh, but we are, absolutely, we see that with smartphones, uh, with social media, the dopamine hits that we get off those, uh, some of the studies, even the number of likes 
that you get from yeah. friends on social media, the number of likes corresponds directly to the, an increase in dopamine. So the more likes, the more dopamine. The oxytocin level, which is what we call kind of the the, the cuddle hormone, mm -hmm. which is that uh, the, the love hormone that, that you feel it gives you a feeling of well-being, you know, between say a mother and a baby, um, when you um, have tr that, that true uh, long-lasting love, that kind of feeling, that also increases with the use of the phones as well. And and our we become quite addicted to them. So we see that almost 95% of the people surveyed use their uh, look at their phones before bedtime and about 90% of 18 to 29 year olds will actually sleep with their phone probably right beside them yep and <laughs> sounds and about, about right in my household yeah, <laughs> yeah and about and about 1 in 5 will wake up in the in the night just to check their social media and get that dopamine hit uh, as well so it's uh, it's really fast. And another another stat that it was I found really interesting was about about one in five of us would would forgo seeing our spouse our spouse for a week rather than uh, than forgo their phone for a week. So wow, I mean, <laughs> you can see that that's just twisted. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> I know it's going to be the opposite of what we want. But um, yeah, so you know. But despite all that. You know, I think it's important to mention, despite all that, those good hormones sort of thing that, that they're flowing through our brains when we look at our phones, there's now a direct link that we found between heavy social media use and depression yes. as well. So, uh, and this is where we get into the really interesting stuff. So you look at, it's not just looking at a screen. We know that screens are bad for kids, um, that real flashy uh, screen that, you know, excites the brain to a, you know, almost a, to a, a point that's into a fight or flight type response. But for adults, um, it's not the screen per se. It's the feeling that social media gives them, um, potentially the negative feeling with respect to comparing themselves to other people. So that whole social comparison bit, um, seems to be profound, um, in the way that, uh, it plays out with our, with our media use. Um, and also how it plays out with respect to our to our health, like the effects that it actually has on us biologically. And when we talk about social comparison and how it affects um, our life satisfaction, right, there's a lot of research that was done probably in the early 2000s about, you know, keeping up with the Joneses, that if you really mm -hmm. want to, you know, put the kibosh on your happiness, compare yourself with your neighbor. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So we have, you know, we look at happiness, you know, there's that life satisfaction bit. Um, there's also the, you know, the enjoyment of life. And and sometimes they get separated out, you know, and rightfully so. So life satisfaction can be achieved. We, we know we talk about, oh, money can't buy happiness. Well, um, in some respects, <sighs> you know, you have to have a basic level of, of survivability to achieve a life happiness. And uh, what we have in the book as well is that, um, you know, to a certain extent it does buy happiness it, and, but only to a point, once you've achieved your, you know, basic um, sustenance, you have achieved this kind of life satisfaction, it kind of levels out, but your enjoyment of life, if we look at that, uh, as a separate, uh, measure, that's really about the, the, the wealth that comes through social connections and yeah. the meaning that that happens there and how fulfilling your life is in the big picture with all that those those positive networks as well so they're almost two two different types well they're two different kinds of currency right we need the yes. actual money to live to provide basic needs food shelter safety etc but once we achieve that the let's say one is a hundred hundred millionaire, you know, they're worth a hundred yes. million or 200 million or a billion. Yeah. They're not a hundred million times more happy or a billion times more happy than their less affluent counterpart. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And we also tend to compare ourselves. We talk about this comparison stuff when we're talking about the, the our relative um, position to compare to others. We tend to compare ourselves to people that are within what we think as our peer group. So, you know, a lot of us may not get, you know, uh, upset every single day because we're not, you know, as, as, as wealthy as the wealthiest people in the United States. Um, but if, when we look at our own peer group, that's, that's the important thing. That's what we compare ourselves to. And there's even some differences in the studies between, uh, men and women as well. So it's much easier in the, in the research 
uh, for men to be able to create that separation and say, well, you know, I'm, I'm not in that league. I'm not in that category. So I'm not really going to compare myself to that person, but I am going to compare myself to my colleague and look at his or her life and see, you know, how mine compares. And for women, it's, it's more difficult, uh, in the research, it says more difficult for them to make that distinction that they cannot compare themselves with someone that who is in quite a bit different peer group. Um, we're going to need to take a break, but before we do, I want to just tap into stress, negative stress or distress versus positive stress or use stress and the impact of the two on our health and well-being. And I'd love for you to kind of comment on that because people say, you know, I need to eliminate stress out of my life. Well, A, we can never fully eliminate stress out of our lives. And B, there is an upside to good forms of stress. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, a great example of that is, say, athletics. And I have a bit of a background in, in athletics as well. So you want to be on that that top of that bell curve, you know, right in the middle of that happy place with all that. You can't be you can't be too relaxed and too under stimulated, yeah. um, not stressed enough, in other words, to perform. But yeah, once you slide off the other side and you and you start and you get jittery, nerves uh, take control of you. Um, yeah, then your performance starts to decline because you're into this negative stress territory. So we do want to stay. We do want to stay in the middle, and it, it is about that uh, work life balance or work life integration, so to speak. Um, how you balance those out with respect to your managing your own stress in your life, and there are some techniques that if you want to talk about, we can get into as well later on. Let's. Do it. We're going to take a break and we'll be right back to learn more about Dr. Robert Barrett and his book, Hardwired, How Our Instincts to Be Healthy Are Making Us Sick. Please visit www.drrobertbarrett.com on Twitter at Dr. Robert Barrett. We'll be right back. And that is a promise. Who says money can't buy happiness? Whether you are a skeptic or seeker, check out Lisa's new book. Are we happy yet? Eight keys to unlocking a joyful life. A boot camp manual for greater emotional fitness is available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, IndieBound, and HarvestingHappiness.com. Here's a truth bomb. Emotions are contagious, and happiness is a universally desired state. But we tend to forget that we all have the freedom to be happy or the liberty to be miserable each day, regardless of external circumstances. Explore the journey of human happiness, how to find it and keep it, with Lisa's documentary film, H Factor. Where is your heart? Visit HarvestingHappiness.com to learn more. Continuing the conversation with Dr. Robert Barrett, we're speaking about tasting truth, feeding ourselves healthy, and hacking our hardwired brains. Let's return to the conversation. So, doctor, talk to us about what we can do, some interventions to better manage our stress and better manage our lives and get ourselves back on uh, an even keel. Okay, great. Yeah, the you know, the challenge always is, is that we tend to know the things that are going to make us better. Like we, you know, Oh, I'm going to eat better. I'm going to mm. sleep. I'm going to sleep more. I'm going to do this or that. You know, we know those things, but you know, part of the premise of, of our book really is that, you know, overcoming this hardwiring is a challenge. It's a challenge. You people try to diet, you know, why am I not losing weight? Why can't I quit smoking? You know, all of these things are a real challenge. And what we found is that, uh, first of all, if you look at willpower as as the idea that you know this is the the inner strength that you have to be able to stop yourself from doing bad things well one of the things is that we that that's like a finite resource it's almost like you know the gas in your car uh, and you can use it up um, before and you have to replenish it and the way that you replenish that is by taking small kind of tactical breaks to do fun things that feed that reward system in your brain and if you feed that reward system in your brain, and, and there's research behind this, if you feed that reward, you're able to perform a lot better. You're actually able to replenish that willpower and, and use it. So re taking small rewards might be, you know, doing fun things in a positive way, spending, you know, going outside, going for a run, spending time with family, you know, watching that, you know, crazy comedy, um, you know, sitcom, something that makes you laugh. Doing something that that is a, a, a you know a positive indulgence that 
that allows you to replenish that that willpower. So there's been some really great studies on that. So that's that's one thing. And then and then really that the social connection bit is is very powerful in in de-stressing. We, you know, sometimes we say, oh, we have to, you know, carve out time in our day. And that is true. But you can only carve out time in your day to, to uh, de-stress if it doesn't add stress uh, when things pile up on your on your desk that you have to deal with again. So um Part of that that works sometimes it depends on on how busy a person you are, but it's uh, but that real social connection as well allows you to de-stress. And there's lots of evidence and research to uh, to back that up as well. Well, you know the uh, little the nano breaks. You know, even during the day, even stepping outside and walking around the block, getting a ten minute nature bath. I mean, I think there's been some research done on that. How that little tiny reset in the day can be helpful to, you know, because you're getting a, a dose of vitamin C, vitamin D, you're, you know, you're getting out into the trees and nature. So it doesn't have to be big. I think that that's no. really, really important. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about our diet and addiction to white substances such as salt, sugar and flour and how that impacts the body's immune system response and emotional life. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we, I think we were, we were joking that you were evolved to, you know, hunt all day for a carrot um, and, you know, and all the great sugar in a carrot. But we, you know, we get so much of that uh, added sugar um, in a, uh, you know, a Slurpee or, or added sugar in our, in our um, coffee or tea. Uh, we are completely bathed in, in white sugar and uh, in added sugar and, and, and that is yeah, absolutely having a detrimental effect for us. And it's very, very difficult for us to tur- turn off this craving. This is a, a dopamine reward system, mm. and it's extremely powerful, so powerful that it, it can be more powerful than, than, you know, hardcore drugs, you know, and, and you know, the, the kind of drugs that we that we think people get extremely addicted to. You know, the sugar can be right up there uh, yes, with it can. that level of addiction. <laughs> so and so, you know, and you're thinking about something like, you know, a, a, you know, a, a big can of Coke or a Slurpee that has, you know, say 20, 20 plus spoonfuls of sugar in it. Uh, we, we're, we're so used to it. You know, it we we joke in the book about, you know, it would be we would all be aghast if, you know, if uh, if we saw a parent, you know, putting 20 some spoonfuls of sugar in their kid's mouth to, to chew on. But yet we give these these soft drinks and others that in other forms of beverage that have this kind of sugar in them. And and that be, has become commonplace. And the other really interesting thing about our brain is just like a drug that we need more and more and more of it to get the same level of dopamine release. Yeah. So there's been some great studies on that that say, you know, if you do this all the time, um, you need more of it the next time to get the yeah. same level of dopamine release. And that's what your that's what your brain wants. It wants that dopamine. Well, it sounds to me and from what I've read that our brains have become so hyper stimulated that um, it's it's hard for us to also s- settle it down. You know, we're so used to being in that heightened state of alert, fight or flight, whether or not we're really truly at risk, that it's hard for us to, you know, self-manage and regulate and and come back down to a, a neutral grounded spot. It is true. Uh, we have an entire section. We talk about kids. So that's one that's one part of that story is is kids that are watching screens, particularly the kinds of, of programming on screens or games that are very, very flashy, that move faster than real life, and that stimulate their brains in ways that almost inhibit the type of development that you would normally see in a brain. The brain develops from in childhood, it develops from the, the base of the brain up to the to the executive function, to the forebrain. Um, and you get stuck in, in, a, in you know, for you get stuck in a kind of fight or flight response in the amygdala area of the brain. And and that that level of stress is very difficult for them to to turn off. And that can have lifelong implications as well. And in for adults as well, we see that in the 24 seven news cycle, we get caught up in that. It's, you know, these these headlines that are attention grabbing that are meant to again, stimulate our brains um, to get us to to read the articles and to look. 
but it's it's very difficult for us to turn that off. And we have this sort of fear of missing out, this FOMO that if we put our phones yeah. down and turn them upside down for a minute, you know, we're going to miss something that's, you know, ama- you know, amazing and catastrophic in the news that we should be paying attention to. And when we talk about being a sleepless society, you know, this 24 hour news cycle, having the devices near us, our brains and bodies are overstimulated. It's hard to settle down. The flashing screens make it difficult to get to sleep. They shouldn't really be in the bedroom, but yet many of us bring them in there. And then the sleeplessness itself is deleterious to our health. Yeah, it is absolutely. So that's on a couple of fronts, right? We have the so we have the, the the social addiction, so to speak, to what's happening on our phones, the content that's happening on our phones. Then we also have the you know the physiological side of it too. That basically the blue light that we look at, we yeah. staring into this into this brightly lit screen while our brain is is saying, hey, it's dark outside. We should be you know releasing melatonin and settling down. And you know the the fact that we are uh, interrupting some of our sleep cycle with this blue light and disrupting the, the normal patterns of, of how we should be resting in the sleep phases, that can have a very negative effect. I mean, if you shorten your sleep cycles, uh, you reduce your, your cancer fighting cells in your body by a huge percentage. So you're leaving yourself open to all sorts of cancers. There's cardiac effects as well. Um, all of these uh, can have can manifest in real, real health, health problems and mental health. You know, when we don't have appropriate sleep, our mental health suffers. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It, it really does. There's no doubt about that. Um, let's uh, we're, we're almost out of time. And I want to just um, address one final point, And that is about achieving more health equity. You know, what are some of the steps that we as a society can do for one another to help get us there? Yeah, I think that it's a big ask. But, you know, when we talk about health care, you know, we really are not quite there yet. We have disease care. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably a more accurate way to look at it. Uh, we're very good at, um, you know, okay, someone goes to the doctors because there's there's something wrong with them. And now they need the doctor to help figure it out. And they have to manage whatever's going on. But that's more like a disease care. This pro this this health prevention, uh, you know, this preventive uh, strategy that's more really in line with the term health care is something that we, we have to aspire to. And we do have to look at all segments of the population, those that may be somewhat left behind and neglected by by, you know, the so-called health care world and, and, and health promotion. And we have to make sure that we're uh, we're all getting the best chance we can. So uh, and then I think we just that awareness, you know, that that's a big piece of our book. We have some prescriptive, you know, help in the book. But really, it's about increasing this awareness of this is how our brains and bodies are working. These are the challenges that we're seeing right now as well. So that awareness bit is is powerful. That's a good starting point. So it sounds like that the book, like Hardwired, How Our Instincts to Be Healthy Are Making Us Sick, um, is a call to action for a biopsychosocial focus. You know, so it's healthcare promotion, not healthcare management, like as you were saying. It is. It is in a sense. I mean, it is a way of looking at our health that combines our social world and our medical selves, our biological selves. So... Uh, when I worked with uh, Dr. Francis Schetti, who is the co-author of the book, uh, he's a, an MD, he's an ER physician and professor. So he looked at things. Why do we do the things that we do from a medical standpoint? I asked the same question from a from a social science standpoint. And we realized that really it's the friction point between these two things that is the most revealing and telling feature of our health today. And, and that's where we have to look is the combination of lens between our social world, which is changing very quickly, Mm -hmm. and our physiological and biological selves. We can't look at these in isolation anymore. It has to be combined. And I think that's the real power of the book. I I agree. And you you mentioned it in terms of the work-life integration, and also it's about health integration. It's an integrated approach to our well-being. Yeah, absolutely it is. It's, it's, It's a way of understanding how uh, everything affects us. 
yeah. in it, I mean, it's it's you know from your from your social media um, how that works in the brain. It's you know we know we know maybe how it how it makes us feel. We know maybe how our diet makes us feel or lack of sleep. But understanding um, it, you know in a in a few chapters, understanding how that works and why that is the case, and then that is the starting point from where we can we can start making changes as well. To learn more about how your beautiful body works, please pick up Hardwired, How Our Instincts to Be Healthy Are Making Us Sick. To learn more about the author and my guest today, go to www.drrobertbarrett.com on Twitter at Dr. Robert Barrett. Thanks for being with me, doctor. I really appreciate it. It's very informative. Yeah, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness today. This is Lisa cypress Kamen and my guests, Dr. Robert Lustig and Dr. Robert Barrett, wishing you kind thoughts, kind words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Please go out and rock your day and remember to be kind to each other. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime and anywhere from the comfort of wherever you are. Subscribe, listen, and share hundreds of downloadable episodes via our free app or from our libraries at toginet.com, iTunes, Google Play, and other fine podcast platforms. To learn more about Lisa's global consulting services, please visit harvestinghappiness.com. Spread more joy by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and following Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen. Harvesting Happiness is produced in collaboration with Toginet Radio, KBUU Radio Malibu.net, and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange.